welcome to the historic city of York, my hometown. 40 years ago, I had the privilege of following in the footsteps of my two brothers, my dad and my uncle, of becoming a York Minster choir boy. If you're wondering what that experience was like, imagine going to school at Hogwarts, but instead of learning to cast spells, we learned to sing in what I think is the most beautiful cathedral ever built. My first five years in formal education was spent here, singing in this gorgeous choir. We sang for heads of state, royalty, and Dame Judi Dench topped a long list of celebrities. But I didn't stop for a minute to think about celebrities. What quickly became an obsession for my young mind was the history encased in this building from the Roman crypt, the, the bits of uh, a Roman town, of the original Roman town of Ibarakum, dating from around the fourth century, underneath my feet right now. Also, Archbishop Aldred was called to London in 1066 to crown William the Conqueror, the new King of England. And of course, Henry VIII's infamous visit in 1541. What didn't help my ever inquisitive mind was the place that my parents used to take me to play after school. Because just a short walk from the Minster, you find yourself here at a place today known commonly as the Museum Gardens. This is actually a botanical gardens covering 10 acres and it's right in the heart of York so it's a real sanctuary and whilst my brothers and I used to love coming in here to play hide and seek between the trees and picnic actually on many an occasion it was the castle that lies at the heart of the museum gardens that always really drew our attention the funny thing is though this hauntingly beautiful place isn't actually a castle. And if you look a bit more closely, you can see straight away what it once was. These stones ahead of me, for example, it's not difficult at all to realize that these would have once been a great pillar supporting a stunning roof, just like at York Minster. One day, utterly fascinated by this just tantalizing building, I said to my mum, did this used to be a church like the Minster? And she said, yes, it did. And I said, well, why is this one in ruins and the Minster still standing tall? She said, it's because this one used to be a monastery. And she told me that if I like this one, wait till I saw all the others all over Yorkshire. My mum planted a seed in me that day that became a lifelong passion for these amazing buildings. From Byland's Abbey to Revo Abbey, and from Fountain's Abbey to Gerbo Abbey, the last 38 years have taken me on a quest all across Yorkshire as I've tried to discover the story behind these fascinating buildings. Why were they built? Who lived here? and why do most of them now lie in ruins? This is a story with heroes and the ultimate villain. And it's all set in the most stunning landscape that Yorkshire has to offer. Welcome to the rise and fall of the monasteries.
So this is it. It's the start of our next great quest. We've traveled 58 miles northeast of York, and we've come to the ancient coastal town of Hartlepool to begin what's going to be a really epic adventure. But what exactly are we going to do this series? Well, over the next nine episodes, we're going to visit monasteries all over Yorkshire, my hometown of Yorkshire. And we're going to take a walk in their absolutely amazing grounds and we're going to learn the story of the monasteries, but also we're going to be learning the story of the history of England from really the, the Middle Ages right the way through until the time of the Tudors, because that story is actually intertwined with the story of the rise and the fall of the monasteries. But we're starting here today at Hartlepool because this is a place which once was home to a lady who had a very important part in really sort of triggering the rise of the monasteries. Without her, some historians argue, none of what happened afterward, none of what we're going to see in this series would have been possible. Her name was Hilda, and this was a place which she once knew well. So we're off on what is going to be a truly epic quest. I'm quite daunted by the prospect because we've already covered some miles in this episode and we haven't finished yet folks. Over this series we're going to be real, it's not globe trotters because <laughs> we're just going to be all over the county of Yorkshire but we're going to be covering more miles than we ever have in any series we've ever produced before. And I can't wait to be honest. Now, Every walk that I do in this series, you're going to be able to follow along with me at the OS Maps website. If you head to the OS Maps website and you just search for the rise and fall of the monasteries, in fact, let's just make it rise and fall of the monasteries and then put the episode afterwards. So this episode would be rise and fall of the monasteries, episode one. The walk will appear and you'll be able to see it on the map and see exactly where I'm walking. And if you're wondering actually what that is behind me, it's not ancient at all. You see something like that, don't you? Like we did at the start of the episode and you think, oh, lovely Victorian pier. It's really not. Streetly Pier used to take cold water into a chemical plant that used to be just over there. It's not there anymore, thankfully. This is sort of... It was a hot spot, really from the 50s right the way through to the early, early 2000s for sort of chemical works, ICIs based a little bit further down the coast. But thankfully we're not here to talk about that. But I tell you something, the one great thing about the northeast coast is no matter where you look like that, there's always something interesting to see. This place actually became known as Stag Island. And the name really lives on to this day because the heart in Hartlepool is derived from the ancient word for deer, which was Herat. And it was in 649 AD that Hilda arrived here. And it would have looked a whole lot different then to what it does today. Following the withdrawal of the Roman Empire 240 years earlier, Celtic tribes began to re-establish themselves after hundreds of years of Roman rule. This would have been a brutal time as rival tribe fought against rival tribe to claim the best real estate.
Word quickly spread across Europe that land here was ripe for the taking. And so three powerful tribes from across the sea, the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. The Angles actually were from Germany, the Saxons were from Denmark, and the Jutes were from the Netherlands. They arrived here on the northeast coast to claim their spoils. But in 649 AD, all this was just beginning. And I, I just can't begin to imagine what it must have been like living in that time of Anglo-Saxons with warring kingdoms in each different county of England, fighting each other, battling each other for supremacy. If there's one sort of comparison I can give you, this was like Game of Thrones without the dragons, but for real. And you also have to remember that this was a time in the world, in humanity, when we really didn't understand the laws of physics. We didn't understand how the body worked, and we certainly didn't understand medicine. So it's no surprise, is it really, that into that maelstrom sprang the religion of Christianity. That wooden church would be rebuilt again and again over the centuries until it became York Minster. Can you believe it? The place where we started today. And I had no idea, even when I was filming that in York, I had no idea, otherwise I would have made reference to it, that that is the place where Hilda was baptized. I love the, the human element to this story as well because you know, King Edwin, he marries a Christian woman and he's probably taking her to services and getting a bit of an experience of what it's like to be a Christian. And also as well, I've known so many couples over the years who've ended up with similar interests. So you can sort of see how he ended up deciding that his whole court should become Christian. But what he can have never imagined is the impact that that decision would have on young Hilda. And I think it's really important to remember that fact. Christianity was still in its very early stages of development. A lot of people think that the Romans brought Christianity here in 380 AD, and whilst they did, 30 years later, they'd gone. So it never had time to establish. It took nearly 300 years for that to change. And when it did, there was two rival factions vying for supremacy. The problem was, Patricius was going it alone, but he did do a phenomenal job because his teachings spread all across Ireland into Western Scotland 
and then into England. Now, Patricius, or St. Patrick, as he came to be known, believed in small monasteries with simple wooden churches, more like a sort of barn, and then surrounding that very simple wooden huts, a very simple lifestyle. And the town that we're arriving in now, Hartlepool, was one of those early Christian communities. And in 649 AD, Hilda arrived here to become its abbess, its leader. The cemetery is actually located around the current parish church, which we're on our way to now. When Hilda arrived here, things really couldn't have been more different. That huge forest was still here. There was little else here, really, apart from the monastery. And when I say monastery, I think of those spectacular buildings that we saw at York and that we're going to visit throughout the series. But here, it really could not have been more different. It was a simple wooden church, looked like a barn. But let me tell you, that church does not look like a barn today. The church that we see today was built in the 12th century and over the next 900 years it's been renovated and, and upkept so it's still standing and it's still in use today there's actually a, a service going on right now now we don't know for certain but if we look across the country and we look at the way churches were normally built they're normally built on top of an existing site so historians are fairly certain that Hilda's original church would have stood on this footprint and it was from here that Hilda started to lead her community from Hartlepool and she did such an amazing job she was chosen for promotion and she was asked to lead a much bigger monastery at a, a town called Whitby, about 50 miles south of here. This was a huge promotion for Hilda, and it put her at the heart of Christianity in Northumbria, and in time, it would put her at the heart of this growing religion across England and the whole of Europe. But at this moment, there was a problem because Hilda followed the teachings of St. Patrick, and so did pretty much the kingdom of Northumbria. And the question was, would Northumbria and England continue to follow the teachings of St. Patrick, or would they start to follow the wider Christian teachings that were coming out of Rome? The answer to that question came in 664 AD. The first ever meeting of the Christian church took place in England, and the venue for that meeting was Whitby Abbey. At the meeting, both sides of the argument were called to put forward their points of view. So the Church of Rome was there and St. Patrick's Church was there, the Celtic Church. Now, it was a harshly fought debate according to the history books and there's lots of written sources. This one was actually written in 731 AD by a monk called Bede. But at the end of a harshly fought debate, it was decided. And who knows, you know, 
what say Hilda had in this, but given her reputation, she must have had some. And the fact that it was chosen to take place under her watchful eye in Whitby, you can only assume that she must have had quite a large say in what went on. But the, the decision was a definite one and it was final. Northumbria and in turn England would leave behind the teachings of St. Patrick and they would follow the teachings of Rome. That one event laid the foundations for the architectural explosion that would take place in the rise of the monasteries. Now, whilst Hilda is celebrated across the world as, as the patron saint of learning and also for her work here at Hartlepool and at Whitby, it's for her role in empowering the monasteries, the buildings that this series is about, that I think is her greatest legacy. taken just a short five minute walk from St Hilda's Church down to the beach on the old town walls. And whilst it's easy for us to look back through the generations and to realise that the events that Hilda was part of in 664 AD were integral then to the rise of the monasteries, to her she would never actually go on to see any of the wonderful buildings that we're going to visit in this series. That event in 664 was just the first grain of sand in the rise of the monasteries. Now, over generations, each one of these monasteries was built and was developed, and they're all unique, but they do all have one thing in common. No matter which one you go to, a little bit like Roman forts, they're all laid out in a very similar way. So I thought it would be fun, before we take our first proper visit to a monastery, that we went and just took a look at how they're laid out. And we'll find out a little bit about what went on in each part of a monastery. To do that, we've travelled 48 miles southwest of Hartlepool to one of my favourite places. Welcome, everyone, to Easeby Abbey. Now folks, don't panic. Today is all about orientation. I'm actually going to use Easeby as an example for how all abbeys are laid out. That way, as the series progresses and we visit a cloister, you'll know what it was and what went on there. We're going to come back to Easeby later on in the summer to discover its story. I say that because we're not going to get into the story of Easeby today. Today's all about what went where, and we're going to start right here in the Abbey Church. Now, we've walked down to what would once have been one of the main entrances into the Abbey Church. This section here, and this here was a doorway straight into the nave. 
And the nave is normally the biggest part in any church that you'll visit. Now, the reason why that was the case with a monastic abbey is this is where the most amount of people came in to pray. Very much like modern day churches, there once would have been long benches set either side of a central walkway and at the top of the nave would have stood an altar. Separating the nave from the rest of the church, there was a huge wooden screen round about here with a door in the middle that you could walk through. As we come out the other side, we enter the most sacred part of the church. This is where the choir monks dedicated their time to prayer. To my right, we find a southern extension and to my left, we find a northern extension. These are the transepts, which were full of small private chapels. These chapels were paid for by local wealthy families who wanted prayers said for themselves and their loved ones every day, as regularly as possible. The more you paid, the more they prayed for you. I suppose someone had to pay for all this, didn't they? And as we leave the transepts behind, we enter the most sacred part of the church. This is the choir. Now, before we leave the church behind, there's one thing that I want to show you, and you'll find this at all abbeys, and we'll be looking at lots of these as we tour through the series, because they really are one of my favorite parts of all of medieval monasteries. Now, services were held at all hours of the night, and so the monks needed a quick and easy way to get from their dormitory down into the church. And what every church has, every monastery has, is they have the dormitory stairs. This was the stairwell that was used by the monks at truly ungodly hours, funnily enough, to get down to do their services. And here it is, look at this. Now, what you're looking at there is 12th century. And I think it's absolutely gorgeous. You've got to wonder, haven't you, how many tired <laughs> footsteps came down those stairs over the course of the hundreds of years that this monastery was, was in action. I'm sure lots of them were very keen to come down those stairs, but I'm sure lots were <laughs> wishing for another five minutes in bed. It's wonderful stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Leaving the church behind us now, on the southern side, we find the beating heart of all monastic buildings, and that's the cloister. This was a very special place because it was an open area in the center of all the monastery's buildings. And the best part about it was, there was a covered walkway around that open area. So even if it was raining a bit, I could still get outside and get some exercise and not worry too much about getting my vestments wet. The cloister would have been a busy but inspirational place. If the monks weren't in the church praying or sleeping in their dormitories, which is actually just behind this wall, they would have been here. Desks were positioned all along one side for study and for training of novices. And there would have been people walking here and talking or contemplating. And also, every building that empowered abbey life was positioned directly off the cloister. So it made it really easy to get from one place to another. Breakfast was actually a meal rarely eaten until well into the 16th century. This building actually would once have been 
two floors and it was upstairs that the monks ate. They also ate in silence, whilst one of their brethren, one of their fellow monks, used to read to them from the pulpit, which is just up there. All the abbeys that we'll visit in this series were run by men and the man at the top was called the abbot and this was the place where he used to meet with all his most senior monks. This was the chapter house and it was tradition for dead abbots to be buried under the feet, under the floor, so that their wisdom then would rise up through the feet of the men who were meeting above them. Now, as we'll find out when we get later on in this series, at the height of their powers, monasteries were covering and governing huge swaths of land and people through the, the jobs that they were creating. So sort of think of this space as the boardroom where the directors would meet to make all the important decisions so that monastic life and the life that, that sort of spread out from the monastery could continue. So we've taken a look at arguably the busiest parts of the monastery and we'll find the chapter house, the refectory, the dormitory and the church in exactly the same place in every abbey that we'll visit. But there's one more really important place to go take a look at and that's the infirmary or the hospital as we know it today and we'll find it down here. because it wasn't just the monks who were cared for. They looked after everyone within the Abbey community. If they were lucky and they were unwell, they'd find themselves right here because the modern day equivalent of this building is a local hospital. And we'll learn much more about this later on in the series. The final stop on our abbey orientation is the abbot's house and we're walking straight down the basement of it now. Now the abbot was of course the man in charge and he was the only person who had any form of privacy. And that was because he would regularly have to meet with the lords who were paying for all of this, all the wealthy people who were paying for the chapels. They would come in and they would see him and he would have meetings and they would take place here. Now he used to live and work in a floor now that's long since gone. It's on the second floor here. But those holes in the walls that you can see once supported the beams which held up the floor which the abbot would once have walked across.
That, ladies and gentlemen, is pretty much it. You now know your way around a medieval monastery. Now, there are some ancillary buildings, which we'll discover more of through the course of the series. But for now, my goodness, we're set to go. Now, this building is obviously in ruins, like all the monasteries that we're going to visit in this series. And what I'm going to endeavour to do through the course of the series is to bring these buildings to life. We'll learn about what they look like, who were the people who lived here, and what were their stories. It's going to be amazing, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I can't wait to start. So that's it. We have discovered the story of the rise of the monasteries. I cannot wait for the next seven episodes where we're going to visit some of my favourite monasteries all across Yorkshire. It's going to be the most fantastic adventure. And then we'll conclude the series, I think it's going to be in September, where we'll tell the story of the fall of the monasteries. Now you may be wondering what happened to Hilda. Well, she remained abbess at Whitby Abbey for 23 years. She lived until the ripe old age of 66. And whilst that might not sound very old to you and me, back in those days, in, I mean, really, it was still sort of the Dark Ages, early Anglo-Saxon period, old was 30. So to live till 66 was just outstanding. But her name has lived on because she was venerated, she became a saint, and now schools and colleges all over the world are named after her. She may be gone, but she's far from forgotten. But what became of Hartlepool Abbey, the place where Hilda made her name. Well, that's a story that we're going to conclude later on in the series. Right now, all that's left for me to do is to thank you so much for joining me on what has been the biggest episode of anything I've ever produced in my life. And I hope so much that you've enjoyed it. And this is just the start, because I'll see you next time for more Rise and Fall of the Monasteries. Thank you.